In this video, I'm going to answer a question that I get from time to time and will probably get more and more common as time goes on. That question is, who should learn backpropagation in 2020 and beyond? First, let's start with the fact that I completely understand where this question is coming from. It makes total sense. If you are new to deep learning, you've probably come across some blog article showing you how to build an image recognition network in Keras, and you were probably amazed at how easy it was. You basically have state-of-the-art machine learning at your fingertips in a few lines of simple code. By the way, the Keras API is now standard in TensorFlow 2, so if you learned Keras before, then you're pretty much ready to go in TensorFlow as well. So after seeing the power that you can have with just a relatively tiny bit of effort, why would you want to do something like backpropagation, which is basically a giant and very messy calculus exercise? Especially for some of you who haven't done calculus in like 20 years or even worse, have never done calculus at all. Now, I want you to think of this from another perspective. Why is the title of this course, Data Science, Deep Learning, and Python in the first place? Well, I'll tell you that when I first started this course, not many people even cared about deep learning. I was the first instructor, I think, to ever create an online course and call it deep learning. I put data science in the title because back in those days, data science was still kind of a prestigious umbrella term that encompassed a lot of machine learning and statistics alike. Nowadays, the term data science seems to me to be a very cheap and insignificant term as it's been co-opted by marketers and SEO experts. And people for some reason have combined data engineering with data science, which should be separate in my opinion. But that's beside the point. What I'm getting at is this course was created so long ago that many of the libraries you know and love today, like PyTorch and TensorFlow, simply did not even exist. The inventor of Keras only just started working at Google. The TensorFlow library was only just released at the same time I created this course. So if you were ever wondering why didn't this course use Keras or why didn't this course use TensorFlow, it's because they basically didn't even exist. In those days, backpropagation was still very much a central part of the deep learning curriculum. Anyway, that's just a digression, but maybe now you understand how this course came to exist in the first place. But why should you learn backpropagation in 2020 and beyond? In this lecture, I'll present to you two very common scenarios, which, if you encounter them, will pretty much be showstoppers in your deep learning journey. If I had to summarize these two scenarios, this is what they would be. Number one, your competition is learning that propagation by the thousands. Thousands upon thousands of students are graduating with computer science degrees every single year, and it's only getting more popular thanks to machine learning. If they have these skills, but you do not, how will that make you look in front of your next employer? What other special skills do you have to offer that would make up for or even outshine the students who have graduated and are now entering the professional world that do know backpropagation and that do know the math behind machine learning better than you? Of course, you can't really answer this question confidently unless you truly know what knowing the math has to offer. You can't have an opinion simply because you don't like math or you're not good at math. Then your opinion is simply uninformed. You have no idea what your competition knows, and that is even worse. Number two, eventually, your ability to understand concepts in deep learning and machine learning will diminish until you simply can't go any further. I'm seeing this all the time. I did a little experiment recently where I made a course all about deep learning using TensorFlow and the Keras API without any heavy math or backpropagation. What I noticed is that for students who have not learned backpropagation, their understanding of what's going on is severely limited. They're pretty much stranded in a place where their only option is to copy someone else's code. That's great and all, but do you really want to be a worker that can only copy code that other people have written? If I were your boss or your potential boss, why would I hire you when I could hire the guy who wrote the code that you copied from? Again, it's a matter of what are you bringing to the table that's better than what other people are offering. If all you can do is copy code, then you'll never be able to create anything new. You'll never be able to solve new problems, and other companies will always have a competitive advantage over yours, simply because by definition, in order for you to copy something, it must have already existed somewhere else. Of course, I don't want to say any of this without concrete examples, so that's what's coming up next. All right, so let's go back to the birthplace of deep learning, where this all started. 
Decades ago, Jeffrey Hinton, who I'm sure you're all familiar with by now, taught a course called Neural Networks and Deep Learning at the University of Toronto. Naturally, this course still exists. So let's see what these guys are up to. Ah, well, it looks like, you guessed it, backpropagation lecture six. So let's see what we've got in this lecture. Looks like some math, some more math, more math, lots of math. Okay, let's check out homework one. Oh, look, deriving gradient descent update rules. All right, maybe that's a fluke. Let's check out homework two. Oh, look, derive a sequence of vectorized mathematical expressions for the gradients of the cost with respect to W and B. Man, well, the lazy programmer can't always be right. This has got to be a mistake. Let's try one more time. Homework three. Derive the backprop equations for computing. Oh man, well, there you go, guys. Gradient descent and backpropagation. As you can see, it makes up a pretty significant portion of the course. Now, I'm not telling you this to make you feel bad, that they know something that you don't. In fact, why would you feel bad? I'm giving you the opportunity to learn the exact same thing. In fact, a better opportunity because I'm going to show you a lot of those tricky spots that you would be forced to figure out on your own in a stressful college setting. Whereas these guys have to do it for homework that is all by themselves, I'm showing you how to do it. So you have someone guiding you who's done it multiple times over. You are not being asked to do it all from scratch. Of course, it would be nice if you could though. So the only way you would feel bad about this is if you rejected the opportunity to learn this stuff. In that case, it's your responsibility and not anyone else's. If you go to your job interview and they ask you, hey, why does everyone else know this but not you? What have you been studying? Oh, you decided not to study it because you didn't feel like it. I'm sure your next interviewer will be completely understanding. Okay, next. Forget about this college stuff. Let's say you've got a good, cushy job. No one is ever going to fire you because you're great friends with the CEO. That's fine. But there's another problem here. How do you do anything worthwhile in deep learning? Your simple three lines of code will only get you so far. You might even get to the point where you can write your own CNN or your own RNN, which are pretty easy nowadays. But if you want to go further than that, say with GANs or with natural language processing or with transfer learning, you can and you will get stuck. This is not a theoretical opinion. I'm talking about real examples from real students. I want to give you some examples, without naming any names of course, of how students who didn't have knowledge of the in-depth concepts were not able to progress in deep learning due to their lack of knowledge. Let's take one simple example to start with, CNNs. CNNs are neural networks that involve convolution. In fact, some CNNs have only convolutions. Convolution is a funny little operation from signal processing, but basically it involves a set of input features, as usual, a convolution filter, and then we convolve the input with the filter and that produces some output. For someone who knows backpropagation, it's obvious how those convolutional filters are trained. They're trained by using backpropagation. For someone who does not know backpropagation, it seems like magic. One of the most common questions I get is, how do we find those convolution filters? Well, we don't find anything. It's just backpropagation. There's nothing really more to say. So that's why it's kind of up to you to understand what backpropagation is. So that when someone says, these are just trained using backpropagation, you actually know what that means. Now, let me be clear. It's not even that you have to do the math by hand. That is not what I'm saying. All you have to have in your mind is the concept of backpropagation. That is enough to understand how convolutional filters are found. Another example I came across recently was with GANs. If you've never heard of GANs, just bear with me and pay attention to the high-level principles. Basically in GANs, you have two neural networks. One is called the generator and one is called the discriminator. Architecturally, you're going to hook up the generator's output to the discriminator's input and the loss will be computed at the discriminator's output. During this time, the discriminator's weights are frozen, and only the generator's weights are updated. We can call these theta d and theta g. So when we do this, we only want to update theta g, but not theta d. How can we do that? Well, again, if you understand backpropagation, then this is obvious. Again, I'm not saying you actually need to do any of these calculations by hand. You're going to use a library like TensorFlow or PyTorch realistically. But this is not about that. This is just about your basic understanding of GANs. So conceptually, how you update theta g is obvious. You do gradient descent. This is just the chain rule. 
you take the loss with respect to the input to the discriminator x hat. x hat also happens to be the output of the generator. So by the chain rule, you take the gradient of x hat with respect to theta g, and this gives you the gradient of the loss with respect to theta g. This precisely describes how the parameters of the discriminator theta d do not have to be updated in this picture. Again, obvious if you know backpropagation, not obvious if you don't. So what's the lesson here? It's that unless you only plan on copying other people's code or using other people's code, you are going to need to understand backpropagation at some point. Even with the examples I gave you, it's not that you have to be able to sit down and work through all the mechanics. In fact, I skipped a lot of examples because I wanted to keep this lecture shorter. And it's not that every neural network you write is going to be from scratch. Clearly, that's not a practical solution to anything. But as you saw with these examples, it wasn't about sitting down and doing math. It was all on a conceptual level only. By not understanding backpropagation, even just conceptually, these students weren't able to grasp some of the more interesting concepts in deep learning, such as GANs. And let's face it, GANs are pretty cool.